We Unhappy Few by the Communist Group. Uh, this is from EndNotes, I think EndNotes 4, but I could be mistaken about that one. Communism will be an intense and unpredictable struggle for life on the part of the species, which no one has yet brought to a conclusion since the sterile and pathological solitude of the ego does not deserve the name of life, just as the treasure of the miser is not wealth not even personal wealth. That was a quotation from Amadeo Bordega. A group of people, or the case of the Praxis group, sorry. A group of people who met through their participation in various struggles decide to produce a theoretical magazine. What they produce could be described as a Marxist journal for anarchists, combining reports of struggles and movements, many of which they participated in, with longer historical and theoretical material. It also embodies a set of assumptions about the role of those who want revolution, assumptions that could be summarized along the following lines. Um, you intervene or involve yourself in struggles, not as teachers or provocateurs, but as fellow proletarians who share a desire for revolution. While ready to make friends and comrades in the struggle, you never make growing a group the goal. Instead, you push struggles as far as they will go by being open to the radical potential of any given moment. You, ruth you ruthlessly oppose bureaucratic manipulators of all stripes and all those who, for whatever reason, are wedded to the return to normality. To do this, you must draw on the rich history of proletarian struggle history that, from the Paris Commune to May 68, from the emergence of workers' councils in the early 20th century through to the refusal of work in the movement of 77, demonstrates again and again the spontaneous capacity of proletarians to leap ahead of their situation, to educate their educators. This way of orienting itself to struggles worked well for the group, both in its practice and in its capacity to make theoretical sense of what was going on in the world. However, when confronting a sophisticated theory that challenged some of these assumptions, the group proved unable to deal with the crisis that the, that the new ideas provoked. A division emerged between a group orthodoxy and dissidents attracted to the new ideas. The group's internal discussion, which has been characterized by an openness and seriousness towards critique, became polarized between these two sides. One side feeling it had given the discussion as much time as it deserved, the other wanting to pursue it to the end. The discussion became stuck. Following a logic of conflict escalation, trust broke down, motives became suspected. One side argued that the ideas it was fed up with did not really make sense or add up to that much. They suspected that behind the other side's insistence on pursuing the theoretical discussion, there was a destructive impulse towards the group's previously shared aim. The other side saw defensiveness and bad faith in the first side's argumentation, which they traced back to the discussion, implicitly questioning some key unstated assumptions of the group. At a certain point, the group seemed to arrive at a thoughtful way of going forward. The orthodox side agreed to develop their critique of the new ideas. Although this course of action seemed to offer the possibility of real progress, it was suddenly abandoned. The orthodox side moved from talk to action, expelling the dissidents without any further discussion. Thus, despite the group having enshrined a critique of the sect-like behavior prevalent in other groups, it had split and had done so in an acrimonious and unpleasant way, which had a wrenching, traumatic character for both sides. Those who had left or been expelled reformed as a discussion group, taking a great deal of time to work through what had, ha what had happened. The residual group redirected itself to practical matters, to what it saw as its prime task, the production of the magazine, and rarely discussed what had happened and why. The Case of the Theory Group A small group of individuals meet regularly reading and discussing a variety of texts, talking about whatever is raised that is considered worth talking about. The group imposes a very strict frame for its discussion. Everyone is expected to do the reading, come to every meeting, and be committed to the process for at least a couple of years.
The notion is that such rigid boundaries will allow the content of the group, the conversational process, to be unconstrained and attain a depth that would not be achievable if the commitment to the process was less demanding. Whilst in interest in struggles in communism and in the revolutionary overcoming of capitalism forms a background to why the group had come together, this purpose is not held to tightly, to tightly in the conversation, which is instead allowed to take its own course. There's an idea of being maximally open to what is happening in the world, rather than trying to fit it into any existing theoretical framework. One or more people take up subjects for research with the intention of writing something and bringing it back to the group. There's an idea of eventually publishing in some form, but there is a desire not to rush into it. There's a faith in the idea that if one takes one's time, something truly worthwhile may emerge. That approach seems to be paying off. Dis the discussions are rich and creative. There seems to be something like a collective field between the participants. Ideas flow freely, with each adding to others' contributions without much sense of anyone's owning the ideas. There's a shared sense of making progress together, and that something worthwhile, even important, is developing. The comparison is made to the good feeling of a band jamming whose music is really coming together. However, at other points, relations between individuals and between individuals and the group as a whole become troubled. Distrust, hostility, even paranoia emerge that negatively mirror the intensity of the positive feelings when the group is working well. At times, what is going on feels for some members strange, distressing, even a bit mad. At such moments, the group, which seemed to thrive on the freely given creativity of its members, suddenly makes great demands of time and emotional effort to understand and manage its internal tensions. With some members engaged in postgraduate academia, one fear that emerges is that the ideas freely given to the group's collective discussion may be appropriated by some members to pursue individual academic careers. When one member states his desire to go abroad to study and requests altering the group's way of operating so that he can continue to be involved in some way, a strong reaction is provoked. His departure is felt by everyone as a big loss and a threat to the group's continuity. However, while some might be willing to facilitate membership from afar, others feel the group must take this member's decision to leave the country as a complete break. This, or they themselves, cannot continue with the group. The group is consumed by a tension that is only resolved when this member agrees to cease group membership. Less than a year later, an individual who has played a leading role in the group resigns, expressing exhaustion with the politics of group groupsical life. Going forward, efforts by new people to become involved are as often as not difficult, either for the new members, the existing ones, or both. The group survives these and other stresses, eventually producing a publication that has a measure of success but the feeling in the group rarely touches either the exhilarating creativity or the tension and struggle of the earlier period. These stories express some of the gratifying but also frustrating and unpleasant sides of being together in groups, in this case, political groups. Neither group were sex in the normal sense. They were not orientated towards recruitment and numeric growth, but focused on specific tasks. They were composed of people with a degree of maturity and experience and struggles in theory. Indeed, the way in which the praxis group related to struggles, an orientation largely shared by the theory group, is perhaps about as good an approach as can be suggested. Participation in struggles on such a basis creates moments of connection with others that can be profoundly transformative. However, the emotionally charged way some of the conflicts were expressed underscores a darker side of group life that is also a common experience. What was striking about the experience of the Praxis group was that it, that it prided itself on openness and non-dogmatism towards struggles, but in its own discussions succumbed to an intractable conflict resolved only by resorting to actions that it did not even try to explain rationally. The Praxis group pattern of conflict between a side representing the established position and a dissenting tendency is one often repeated in political groups frequently leading to acrimonious and venomous splits that those outside the group, and even participants themselves, often find hard to understand. 
In the case of the theory group, there was a sudden switch to hostility and distrust after it had functioned at a high degree of almost effortless cooperation. Um, this case captures something experienced by other groups and projects we have heard of, namely an inability to sustain themselves at an initially exhilarating, intensely rewarding, and high level of co cooperation and shared creativity without at some point crashing into an opposite experience of suspicion, mistrust, and antagonism. These experiences seemed quite baffling until we came across some psychoanalytic theories of group dynamics. These theories can explain these and other cases, and we will return to them later. However, we might wonder what relevance such small group experience really has to getting beyond capitalism. If the emancipation of the working classes must be conquered by the working classes themselves, if communism is a matter of billions ceasing through revolution to produce and reproduce capital, changing their form of life and thus themselves, then how do we understand the existence and activity of those minorities, including ourselves, who in the apparent absence of such a general movement develop an explicit consciousness of the need for revolution or communism? Do they have certain tasks now or in the future? Is it possible to be revolutionary in the absence of revolution or to be communist in the absence of communism? If not, then how do we understand ourselves and our activity? We? This is a text about the we. Who do we think we are? How do we understand what we are doing? Naturally, we do not mean only the we that produces this journal, but a wider we whose boundary remains unspecified. This text attempts to look in two directions at once. In one lies the group phenomena that will produce communism. This will clearly be at the level of class struggle and social movements, mass strikes, occupations, assemblies, crowds, riots, insurrections, and ultimately revolutions and communization. In the other direction is the experience of being in a small group, more or less formal, orientated mostly to thinking about capitalism and the real movement of its overcoming. Drawing on a distinction made by Henry Simon, we can say that the former phenomena display the features of spontaneous organization, while the latter is characterized by forms of willed organization. Spontaneous organization emerges from a given collectivity, acting to defend its interests in an immediate concrete situation, and is able to change its forms and goals as that situation develops. By contrast, willed organization is defined by a limited, often very limited, number of people coming together on the basis of some pre-established ideas of their interests, which they then attempt to promote. Such a polarity corresponds to an experience of the division between the small formal or informal willed groups we participate in and the wider dynamic movements and collectivities of struggle that rise and fall with a logic that goes beyond our wills. Those involved in willed organization are often very attracted to movements of spontaneous organization because they recognize it is the pole out of which social transformation will come. What is the relation between the willed communist group explicitly thinking about the overcoming of capitalism and the spontaneous group phenomena that will carry out that overcoming? There's a there is a naive conception among some communist groups in which they feel that their key role is to persuade other people of the validi validity of their ideas in order to lead the masses or class in its struggles. Faced with their lack of impact on the world, their main activity often becomes to increase in numbers, build their group, organization, or party so that they can have greater influence. Of course, within the spontaneous organization of existing struggles and social movements, there are tasks performed by those involved. Often those performing these tasks or taking such roles emerge from the situation of struggle itself. At other times, a role can be played by those connecting to such struggles from a pre-existing political identity or willed group involvement. In a revolutionary movement, there would also be tasks to be done. However, it is not at all clear that there are revolutionary tax tasks in relation to existing social movements and struggles nor is it clear in any future revolutionary conjuncture what role, good or bad, those with pre-existing political identities will be able to play. It is with some caution, then, that we attend to the question of who we are 
and what we do in terms of the pole of willed organization. The focus on the small group or milieu can look like navel gazing in the face of the enormity of developments in the world that seem to beg for attention. Talking about who we are, even in a critical way, risks falling into issues of identity formation and position taking, and is reminiscent of some of the bad habits of unre unreconstructed revolutionaries who spend most of their time talking about and to themselves and their movement. A relatively healthy impulse, perhaps, would be to avoid the identitarian question entirely. What matters is to express theoretically what one is able to learn from struggles. If, as suggested by Debord, following Marx and Hegel, theory is the expression of our times and its struggles in thought. It is a matter of indifference who expresses it. Yet, of course, those who actually produce works of theory like Hegel's logic, Marx's capital, or Debord's society of the spectacle do tend to be people with time to read, to discuss, and to think. As Wilfred Byan suggests, if the I or the we of a statement is to be is to the fore, then that is a sign that something false is at work. Ideas that seem indelibly imprinted with the supposed identity of those who have them, whether an individual, this is my opinion, a group, here is what we think, or even an imagined lineage such as Marxism, Leninism, Trotskyism, anarcho-syndicalism, council and left communism, or situationism, are nearly always suspect. Even if such traditions emerged once as a dynamic way of making sense of the experience of a period of class struggle, they tend to become hardened frameworks into which experience is forced to fit. One can see such isms as so many apparatuses for thinking, which in fact have generally become apparatuses for not thinking too much. We would hope that the texts that have appeared in endnotes simply give expression to some true thoughts about the world, about capitalism and the movement of its overcoming, rather than imply our identity as a group, as individual authors, or as a political tendency. However, we are on some level also a group composed of a number of individuals and our participation in larger groups or in larger group processes and struggles are also mediated through this. As we draw from our own experience of being a small anti-political group oriented to the development of theory, we are aware that this is a pretty peculiar and unfashionable experience. However, the task that we set ourselves thinking about capitalism and the possibility of its overcoming is one that we suggest is not so alien, at least to our readers, and is perhaps at some level in everybody's heads. We engage in self-reflection about what we do and how we do it. That is why in this text we are sharing aspects of how we do this. The Impotence of the Revolutionary Group In a still provocative text published in 1939, Sam Moss, a member of a council communist group in the USA, mercilessly undermined the significance which revolutionaries and revolutionary groups assign themselves. Moss starts off from how the problem appears. On the one hand, there is a we, that of revolutionaries, and on the other, there are the masses or the working class. The former wish to overthrow capitalism, but are incapable of doing so, while the latter, the only possible agent of a revolutionary struggle, are concerned with everyday needs and not the revolution. Asking himself about the reason for this apparent difference in objectives between the masses and revolutionists, he argues that while the masses are socialized by capitalist culture to play the role of machines, the revolutionists are a harmless byproduct. For Moss, the masses are an understandable product of the society, while the revolutionists are merely deviations from the working class, representing isolated cases of workers who, because of unique circumstances in their individual lives, have diverged from the usual course of development. Going further, Moss suggests the ground of the difference is that the revolutionists are unsuccessful careerists, workers who have acquired an intellectual interest and a higher level of education than their fellows, but whose personal advance has been blocked. He continues that although their efforts to help the rest of the class may appear to come from the noblest of motives, certainly it doesn't take much to see that one suffers for another only when he has identified that other's sorrow with his own. Separated from their fellow workers who don't share their concerns, 
The revolutionists tend to unite outside of the workplace with others like themselves, people who are interested in changing society. Yet these groupings and wishing to influence the class struggle in non-revolutionary circumstances are faced with a dilemma. Either they can have an effect, but only by adapting themselves to the limits of the movement, thus no longer being revolutionary, or they can maintain their revolutionary principles, but their intervention will thus be lacking in effect. Moss maintains that such groups have done nothing to affect the course of history, either for good or ill. The separate existence of revolutionary groups is not, then, an expression of their revolutionary nature and function, but a product but a product of this non-revolutionary situation. And when the revolution does come, their numbers will be submerged within it, not as functioning organizations, but as individual workers. A key aspect of Moss's argument is the way he undercuts the justifications that non-Leninist groups and individuals, such as his own avowedly anti-vanguardist council communists, use for their own activity. Noting that council communists and others emphasize their difference from Leninist groups by claiming they do not want to lead the working class, he brutally points out that this amounts only to an ideological difference to which corresponds no practical material difference in such groups' exterior relation to the working class. He also points out that if an anti-Leninist revolutionary group against all likelihood succeeded in their stated purpose of escalating the class struggle, it would be playing exactly the leadership role they reproach the Leninists for wishing to perform. Having given up on the idea that the revolutionary group can escalate the class struggle, Moss outlines a more realistic conception of how what we do might relate to revolution, rather than delude ourselves with illusory stories about the role of revolutionaries and the persuasive power of ideas. We should recognize that our existence and activity emerges from a personal, one might say emotional, need based on the peculiarities of our life histories. Moss notes that while in present circumstances only a small minority feel the need for this activity and they cannot lead or persuade others who do not share it, their existence suggests that when large masses are induced to feel a similar need, not by peculiar personal circumstances but by the objective situation, they will act in the same way, namely to come together and use whatever weapons they can find. Moss suggests that when they act, it will not be because their ideas have been changed, but because of a changed sense of necessity, which when acted upon will result in a change of their ideas. In the meantime, he suggests that while other groups overemphasize the importance of ideas and thus of themselves as the carriers of those ideas, we wish to see the truth of each situation. So what are we? Deviants and freaks. Why do we do what we do? Because it serves a personal need. What can we do then? We can at least see the truth of the situation, perhaps. Moss's skepticism hits a chord. There are hundreds of revolutionary groups, often expressing adherence to particular ideologies, um, which are defined by a prominent thinker of the past often with the terms Marxist, Communist, Anarchist, Socialist, or Workers in their titles, often claiming to be parties or seeing themselves as embryonic poles of recruitment for a future or imaginary party. An understandable reaction to these groups and much of this activity is skepticism. One may find some of these groups more agreeable than others and or find some of their members more agreeable than others, but as a whole, they paint rather a sad picture. There's so much unconsidered and naive presupposition, so much evasion, illusion, and delusion, brazen mismatches between what people actually do and what they think they do, between the story they tell themselves and the reality of their impact on the world, between the grandiosity of their ambition and the misery of their actuality. The great deal of time and energy these groups expend simply on maintaining themselves is also notable. And from time to time, they suffer crises, often resulting in venomous splits and fallouts. Many prefer to avoid that world of formalized groups and exist loosely in a scene or milieu, perhaps engaging in more modest projects. However, even those who have never felt attracted to or are personally repelled by participation in groups' calls may remain in a certain sense part of the communist group,
defined as a set of people oriented to the communist overcoming of capitalism. And it should be noted that illusions are not restricted to formal groups, but also exist among informal milieus and scenes, and of course, even within individuals themselves. The critique of the feelings of other people and groups rarely extends to oneself, and indeed such criticisms of others can act as a binding agent for those sharing one's prejudices. We can all experience some of the difficult and even crazy stuff that tends to afflict formalized groups. Think, for example, of the way in which, within informal scenes such as, such as much as in organized groups, can, conflict is often not about what it purports to be about. How others' behavior, particularly when it is seen to transgress certain norms, can become the subject of scandal and intrigue. How one is pulled to take sides in petty personalized disputes. How emotionally charged arguments can become. How one can feel sucked into certain kinds of behaviors and roles. How painful and personal political fallouts can be. How nasty people can be to each other. It is perhaps no exaggeration to say that both formalized radical groups and looser milieus are prone to forms of madness from time to time. In relation to the pretensions of political groups, we and others often reach for certain Marx quotations. There are his dense theses on Feuerbach in which Marx criticized uh, those who divide society into two parts, one of which has the role to educate the other and argues that social and self-change must be understood as a unitary revolutionary practice in which the educator must be educated. There is his insistence in a letter to Rouge that we do not have principles and doctrines to give to the world and its struggles, but rather that our task is to help the world become conscious of what it is already fighting for. Then there is the line from the German ideology about communism not being an ideal that we seek to realize but rather the real movement that abolishes the present state of things. While the thrust of all these statements is to put the role of communists in perspective, and the real movement, notion, in particular, seems to be a fundamental part of Marx's Hegelian contribution to communist theory, it is not at all obvious what behavior they actually imply. A notion of the real movement can, it seems, mean and justify anything, everything, and nothing. Indeed, it seems to have a danger of acting as a comfort to justify whatever sort of activity one is already committed to. If there is a movement of the abolition of the existing conditions happening before our eyes, it is not at all clear that this is, and how we might, not what this is, and how we might relate to it or participate in it. There are three main approaches or threads that have particularly informed our understanding of this question of who we are and what we do. These approaches can be filed under the following headings. One, conceptions and critiques of organization that emerged in the second revolutionary wave of the 20th century, primarily among councilists, situationists, and left communists. Two, the open Marxist understanding of theory as based on a conversation involving mutual recognition, practical reflexivity, and imminent critique as exemplified in some texts by Richard Gunn. Psychodynamic, cons or th sorry, three, psycho con psycho dynamic conceptions of groups and thinking, especially those associated with, with Wilfred Bayan. These are approaches that we have found useful, which have and continue to inform our activity. So we offer them here. The essential idea is that these threads can inform each other, making up for weaknesses or blind spots of each approach on its own. We do not think that these approaches exhaust the resources that can be drawn on. Reading Gunn is not necessary to make a critical and open use of Marx, nor is it necessary to know Bayan's theory of thinking in order to think. The post-68 debates on organization and the party that we find significant are not the only ones worth looking at. Moreover, much of what any of these sources tell us can be discovered or rediscovered in other ways. What matters is learning from experience, including the experience of trying to think for oneself and with others. The abstraction of this text has to be ultimately brought phenomenologically back to one's own experience. This is something we all have to do in our own way, but we expect people to recognize themselves and their experiences in what follows. And we think what we have found useful might be 
of use to others. One, cancelism and its critique. In the matter of organization, this then is the dilemma of the radical. In order to do something of social significance, actions must be organized. Organized actions, however, turn into capitalistic channels. It seems that in order to do something now, one can do only the wrong thing, and in order to avoid false steps, one should undertake none at all. The political mind of the radical is destined to be miserable. It is aware of its utopianism and, its exper and it experiences nothing but failures. In mere self-defense, the radical stresses spontaneity always, unless he is a mystic, with the secretly held thought that he is talking nonsense. That was um, a quotation from Paul Matic. As has been dealt with elsewhere, the conception of revolution as communization, with which and notes has identified itself, is a product of the second revolutionary wave of the 20th centuries. Or 20th century. Specifically, it develops in France in the years after the most famous event of that wave, May 68. It emerged in response to the struggles of the period and the attempts to make sense of this wave of struggles and how revolution and communism were being posed in a new way. One of the central ways in which revolutions seemed to be posed differently was around what had been known as the question of organization. From 1917 to 1968. It seemed at one time that what was to be done was obvious. In the 19th and early 20th centuries, there were large groups within the working class that claimed to be for revolution and communism. There was an international workers' movement with mass organizations, unions, and parties, adhering at least nominally to revolutionary ideologies such as the Kotsky-Lenin social democratic idea of revolution, or syndicalist or anarcho-syndicalist one. To be a communist or revolutionary seemed to amount to joining such organizations, or at least being part of a movement that these organizations did much to define. However, in the revolutionary wave that ended World War I, and in Spain later, these organizations were not merely defeated in their attempt to deliver the socialism or anarchism that was taken to be their goals. Rather, when put to the test, they seemed to actively betray or suppress the revolution. The parties of the Second International overwhelmingly supported World War I and the dominant party of that international, the Social Democratic Party of Germany, then employed proto-fascists to drown the German Revolution in blood. The Third International imagined itself as refounding revolutionary Marxism, but soon showed itself to be subordinated to the internal policies of the Bolsheviks in Russia, who became engaged in a primitive socialist accumulation, whose main difference from the ordinary capitalist variety that it copied was the terror and rapidity with which it turned peasants into proletarians. In Spain, the anarchist leadership of the CNT-FAI joined a Republican government, and when anarchist workers resisted that government's Stalinist-led police attack on them, the anarchist leaders told them the barricades must be torn down. The very groups that distinguished themselves from the rest of the class as its revolutionary component, and which might at times have played a revolutionary part, also took active counter-revolutionary roles. One reaction in the subsequent period was to cast the issue as one of betrayal. New groups were formed identifying with a view on the earlier history, an understanding of where things went wrong, and of what lessons have been learnt, or which leader or tendency was right. In the wave of struggles in the 60s and 70s, such groups grew somewhat in numbers. However, their attempts to replace the main reformist organizations and to play the heroic role they imagined their preferred ancestors had done in an earlier period were unsuccessful. While in the previous period, revolutionary organizations of the working class had displayed a tendency for unity, Trotskyist and Maoist efforts in the latter period generally displayed a tendency towards fragmentation, competition, sect-like existence, and often a disappearance or reabsorption into the social democratic policy or politics they nominally tried to replace. An alternative to the organizational and, <coughs> and party fetishism of these groups was the perspective of autonomy and council communism.
The Reemergence and Re-Eclipse of Council Communism For many who came together on the streets and in the occupations of 68, a dominant perspective was the rejection of party communism, whether of the official communist variety or that of the Trotskyists and Maoists, in favour of autonomous action by the workers themselves and the idea of all power to the workers' councils. The alternative to organizations like the French Communist Party, PCF, and the trade unions, which opposed themselves to the May movement, was seen to be not a new revolutionary organization, but instead working class self-organization and autonomy, with the revolution seen as the formation of councils and, by means of them, the management of society by the workers themselves. May 68 seemed to vindicate a council communist alternative to the failure of the Russian Revolution, contrary to the accounts of betrayal offered by Trotskyism, Maoism, and anarchism, and their linked response of forming new organizations, Council Communism appeared to provide a more theoretically plausible explanation of what had gone wrong with the workers' movement and communism in the 20th century. Trotskyism held up the advocate of militarization of labor and suppressor of Kronstadt as a libertarian or democratic alternative to Stalin. Anti-revisionist anti Maoism saw through the Russian lie only to replace it with the Chinese lie and classical anarchism blamed the failure of Spanish anarchism on the betrayal of its beautiful idea by its leaders. The Council Communist account of the thwarting of workers' autonomy and self-organization seemed to reach a deeper level of explanation. It was not one or the other leader that was the problem, but the whole phenomenon of reliance on leadership and bureaucratic organization, which could be contrasted to workers' self-activity and autonomous organization. This conception suggests a struggle within the class between its own capacities and will to organize its struggles and its tendency to put its trust in something outside itself. The reappearance of the ideas of Council Communism in 68 might seem surprising. Council, Council Communism as an organized tendency with roots in the German Revolution had more or less ceased to exist by the end of World War II. However, in the post-war period, and especially after the re-emergence of councils in Hungary in 1956, there emerged groups on the edge of the workers' movement, dissident Trotskyists, anarchists, operismo, autonomists, anti-authoritarian and libertarian socialists, etc., who in opposition to the official workers' organizations took up aspects of council communist critique, and especially the perspective of workers' autonomy. In France, the recovery of this perspective had been particularly influential through the group Socialism ou Barbarie. Thus, by the late, or sorry, also called Soub, I'm going to say Soub, but it's S-O-U-B. Thus, by the late 60s, a council communist reading of the failure of the Russian Revolution and the workers' movement generally, and its attempt to articulate an anti-Bolshevik communism had a widespread influence. There was a fit between the anti-bureaucratic and anti-authoritarian spirit of the revolts of that time and the tenets of council communist critique. In particular, the reactionary role played by the unions and official communist parties and workers' opposition to it seemed to support a notion of an autonomous workers' struggle separate from these organizational forms. Additionally, although council communism and many of these new tendencies held essentially workerist perspectives, it was possible to some extent to adapt the problematic of autonomy as a means of understanding some of the new struggles inside and outside of production, in the revolt of youth and the counter-cultural counter movements of the time, and struggles around race, gender, sexuality, etc. Struggles which the primary workers' organizations were often indifferent or hostile to, but which a new generation was attracted to. The perspective of autonomy thus spoke to the general libertarian or anti-authoritarian mood of large parts of the movements of the time, in which the revolution was seen not as the management of society by a new power, but the achievement of autonomy in all areas of life. But if there was widespread agreement that the ideas of workers' self-activity and all power to the workers' councils represented an alternative to the Leninist dreams of the small Maoist and Trotskyist groupsicles, there was disagreement on groupuscles. That's a hard word to pronounce. So I'm just going to say groupuscles. There was disagreement on what this meant in terms of activity. Here it is useful to contrast the proper councilism represented in 68 
par le groupe Information et Correspondance Ouvrière, ICO, with the understanding of the more famous Situationist International, SI. The perspectives of both these groups had some influence on the situation, while the former was characterized by deep skepticism about the importance of revolutionaries and incredulity, incredulity about the narratives they tell about their importance. The latter was known for the significance it attributed to the revolutionary movement and itself as its, as its most advanced component. The Councilism of ICO The Councilist current represented in 68 by ICO and continued to this day by the group Échange et Mouvement starts from a recognition that the question what we should do, which would-be revolutionary groups pose themselves, is generally a function of their position outside a workplace or other situations of struggle. Feeling a need to engage with those directly involved in struggle, especially the workers, the would-be revolutionary will be will try to influence with leaflets or papers offering, if not explicitly, leadership, then at least advice and lessons, or perhaps recognizing the failure of such external intervention. The most militant may try to insert themselves in the situation by going into the factories or wherever the action is expected to be. The councillist refuses the desire for such a role of revolutionaries. Beyond any immediate activity in their own place of work, councillists largely circulate information and analyses, seeing themselves as simply trying to understand what people actually do and the real meaning of these actions. This skepticism about the importance of revolutionaries and their political intervention in these struggles has a strong plausibility when it comes to workplace struggles. It is certainly the case that in such conflicts, the distinction between those inside and outside the workplace is usually fundamental. What to do from the inside is immediately apparent. The possibilities defined by the workers' positions, their roles in the enterprise, the enterprise's place in the economy, the relations with those they work with, etc., by comparison to this, what, what one can do effectively from outside is usually not much, unless it is an activity requested by those directly involved. The collecting and analysis of information about struggles can be a very involving militant activity, but to limit one's activity to this role is unattractive for most politicos and would-be revolutionaries. An oft-repeated claim has been that the councilist position implies being passive spectators of the class struggle and a mere mailbox for the class. Most of those drawn to the idea of revolution tend to assert that there must be something more for us to do. The councilist will argue that those who think this councilist role is too limited are usually impervious to the poor results of their attempts to do something more, to play a, rev to play a revolutionary role. As Henry Simon argues, the form of existence of the willed group its organization around a shared set of ideas rather than the shared situation from which spontaneous organization arises leads to certain determined kinds of action. More often than not, a limited collectivity speaks to and acts towards a larger one in a direction which is inevitably that of people who know or think they know towards those who do not know or know imperfectly and who must be persuaded. By contrast, what is needed for the councillist is to learn from those struggles and to resist temptations to offer advice or direction. The latter is seen as an elitist concept created by those who seek to use and dominate workers' struggles. With the last line, we see that a realistic sobriety and justified skepticism about the pretensions of willed groups slips into something else. The view that such groups and their unwanted interventions are a major obstacle to the autonomous development of the struggle. From the councilist perspective, the mentality of the willed group, this sense of a determinant role, is normally of little consequence, but in times of struggle it is seen to have a detrimental effect. Such groups are seen to relate to the spontaneous organization as an object, at best perhaps going along with the movement while trying to bend it to, towards its own ideology and objectives. One senses here an inversion, the revolutionaries whose sense of their necessity and importance is seen as mistaken are nonetheless granted a powerful role, that of recuperating and fucking up the struggles that would otherwise go further. The SI
The fear of doing something in relation to the class was strongly criticized by another group active in May 68, the, situation, the Situationist International, SI, who wrote, For these workers, doing something has automatically become a shameful inclination to substitute oneself for the worker. For a sort of pure being in himself worker who, by definition, would exist only in his own factory, where, the, where for example, the Stalinists would force him to keep silent and where ICO would have to wait for all the workers to purely liberate themselves on the spot. Otherwise, wouldn't they risk substituting themselves for this still mute real worker? Such an ideological acceptance of dispersion defies the essential need whose vital urgency was felt by so many workers in May. The need for coordination and communication of struggles and ideas, starting from bases of free encounter outside their union union policed factories. Indeed, as the SI's argument continues, there is something self-contradictory and metaphysical in the Councilist line of reasoning. For surely even the limited activity of the few dozen members of ICO producing and sharing their analyses with other workers is a form of substitution of their ideas for those that the passive workers reading them would otherwise spontaneously have had. The SI combined a perspective of all power to the councils with no small sense of the importance of the revolutionary movement and of themselves as its most advanced part. Most commentators on the SI have failed to pick up on how their understanding of themselves as an organization was central to the strengths and the limitations of the theory they produced. As Roland Simon, ar as Roland Simon argues, the lack of modesty in the SI's ideas about the importance of the role of revolutionaries and the revolutionary organization is connected to the novel content that the SI assigned to the workers' councils, and thus to a way in which the SI made a fundamental advance on other groups of the time. In notions like the, like the critique of the poverty of everyday life and the rejection of work, the SI were in touch with a different quality of the revolutionary wave they were immersed in compared to those earlier in the century. In keeping with this different character, the SI argued that the councils would have to adopt a new content based not on the management of workers and the existing world, but the abolition of work in the usual present day sense and the never ending radical transformation of the latter. The contradiction in the SI between its slogans, all power to the workers councils and never work is not an absolute contradiction, but a sight of the productive tension in their outlook. It is thus wrong to see the SI as simply taking over the limits of, of Sub, who had identified socialism with workers' self-management. The SI, as Roland Simon writes, never conceived of communism as workers managing production, the pseudo-control of workers of their alienation. Communism is always posited as the construction of the human community through the abolition of exchange, of the commodity, of the division of society into classes. It is posited in its content rather than as a form of management. But as he continues, in order to reach this point, the SI remains a prisoner of the theoretical necessity of positing a moment in which the proletariat becomes its own object, a moment in its liberation, which explains the great importance of the form of the council as being the existence for itself of the proletariat, this, ex this existence as subject-object, the proletarian class of consciousness as a form. It is in this need for workers through the councils to realize this new revolutionary content of the abolition of work, to become the class of consciousness, that a fundamental role for revolutionaries and revolutionary organization is implied. This high demand placed on the workers and the organizational form through which they become subject is paralleled with an absolutely high demand on the revolutionary organization in the period before this is achieved. The SI rejected out of hand the model that most revolutionary organizations adopt, the, prosel the proselytizing and recruitment of naive members who are then taught the party line. Instead, they demanded from prospective members an autonomous and full integration of the theory and a level of practical truth, namely a coherence of their practical behavior with the theory. The SI would never claim to have produced this total critique from their own heads. While their advanced position in detecting the nature of the new upsurge can be linked with their roots in the avant-garde, 
itself a product of the last revolutionary wave. They also derived their theory from the signs they recognized in new struggles against alienation. From, Aus from Asturian miners to the rioters of Watts, and more generally the youth rebellions seen across the Western world. The task of the revolutionary organization was to grasp what was going on, what was being prefigured in the, in the revolts that were taking place within a unitary revolutionary theory, and to communicate it to those seeking clarification. In their minimum definition of revolutionary organizations, while they write of the need for the revolutionary organization to dissolve itself in its moment of victory, that victory will be the realization of its total critique by the masses themselves in the councils. If there is to be a coming together of the total or integral critique with the forms of spontaneous organization, then that total critique must itself come into existence, and the vehicle for this is the voluntary willed organization. In the year before 68, Debar, Chiari, and Vianette declared that the present task of the SI is to work on an international level for the reappearance of certain basic elements of modern-day revolutionary critique. The activity of the SI is a moment which we do not mistake for a goal. The workers must organize themselves, they will achieve emancipation through their own efforts, etc. There was an important match between the SI's perspectives and what happened in the 68 period, particularly with students and young people. May 68 was the high point for the SI, and there was certainly a widespread impact of their analyses in the student and youth side of the movement, with situationist graffiti being one of the most memorable aspects of the revolt. Nevertheless, they were faced with the fact that their theory did not combine with the action of the workers, who, contra their fantasy, did not come close to setting up workers' councils. The attitude to and later problems that the SI had with their own organization are related to the role that they saw for theory. As Roland Simon points out, the SI replaced a dialectic of productive forces, leading to communism with a dialectic of theory organization consciousness. If it is the council that is to provide the practical conditions for this consciousness, the theory that prefigures this consciousness must itself come to be, and it does so through the spreading of revolutionary critique in which voluntary organization or revolutionary movement and not just the SI, play a part. This need for the coming together of totalizing revolutionary critique, which, on the one hand, would be worked on and spread by groups and individuals within a relatively small milieu, and, on the other, by a spontaneous upsurge from the masses themselves, is the task that the SI, the SI confronted itself with and on which it ultimately fell down. Thus, though the SI had predicted and helped prepare the grounds for the events of 68 better better than any other group, its hopes for the formation of councils that would have a radically different content failed to materialize. The internal struggles which the SI fell into in the aftermath of 68 and their forlorn hope for Strasbourg of the factories was an expression of the impasse of their underlying model of theory, organization, and consciousness. The Citroen Action Committee at Sincere. The different conceptions of what to do held by ICO and SI in 68 can be seen in the Citroen Action Committee at Sincere. In the second half of May, as strikes began to spread, worker student action committees formed throughout France that attempted to support the movement. Those who wanted revolution came together based on their perception of tasks that needed to be done in relation to the movement. Roger Grégoire and Freddie Perlman argue that such worker student committees were a spontaneous recovery of the kind of creative social activity from below that characterized previous revolutionary upsurges like the Paris Commune. They describe their involvement in the workers' students action committee of Citran, one of many such committees based on the occupied sincere center of the University of Paris. Composed largely of people who had met in the street battles of the previous days, it came together in response to the Citroën factories forming a strike committee and calling for an indefinite strike. Perlman and Grégoire 
describe the kind of leaflets produced and actions taken, the way they confronted the issue of the division between immigrant and native French workers, from whom the union militants were drawn, the way the factory's union-run strike committee found the action committee useful in bringing about an occupation of the factory, but then shut it out, and the connection they made of groups of non-union workers in the factories. The committee was autonomous in the sense that it did not recognize the, the legitimacy of any higher body or any external authority. Anyone was able to participate equally in a daily meeting where projects were thought up and actions planned in response to the ever-changing situation. The direction taken by the committee indicated that whatever the, po the political orientations of, participa per of participants before May the orientation which prevailed during the events was more or less a councilist one, comprised of workers' assemblies and workers' self-activity. In terms of Henry Simon's distinction between willed and spontaneous organization, such committees were a spontaneous group where, to a significant extent, the participants left behind their previous allegiances in an orientation to the changing needs of the situation. However, it also had qualities of a willed group because the main purpose of the sincere committee was to speak and act towards the wider movement and to the workers in the factories in particular. What is striking about Perlman and Gregoire's account and of particular interest to us is their self-criticism. In unfavorably comparing the worker student committees they were involved in to the March 22nd movement, Perlman and Gregoire say that for those who gathered at sincere being revolutionary meant participating in something whose dynamic was elsewhere rather than understanding themselves as a concrete group of individuals proceeding by the elimination of concrete obstacles capable of taking the initiative they rather trap themselves in a position of wishing to follow the spontaneous activity of an abstractly imagined group the workers themselves as they argue the concrete group of which they were part the worker student committee, while subjectively feeling ready to make a choice for revolution, looked to some other groups than themselves to trigger this situation. In this, they were perhaps like the overwhelming majority of those participating in the 68 movement. Perlman and Gregoire describe the emblematic mo uh, moment when a march of 10,000 militants confronted CGT stewards at the entrance to the Renault Biancourt factory, which had been occupied the day before by its workers. It would have been easy to climb into the plant, but the marchers allowed themselves to be turned back. A vast crowd who thought they were for the revolution and who had recently fought the real cops at the CRS were nonetheless turned back by a small number of union cops. This was due for Pullman and Gregoire to a certain way of relating to the workers. If the Leninist notion was the workers was that workers must be advised on what to do, and Leninists suggested their parties as an alternative leadership to the PCF CGT, the ultra left or councilist notion, in contrast, was that they had to wait for the workers to do it by themselves. They failed to see themselves as capable of creating a situation that would force such a choice. What this meant practically is that they left the initiative to the union bureaucrats. Perlman and Gregoire suggest that the more radical ultra-left or councilist direction offered by people at Sincere was simply a different discourse in which the Trotskyist and Maoist calls for a revolutionary party and nationalization was replaced by calls for workers' self-organization and socialization of production. They write, Eloquent speeches were not accompanied by eloquent actions because the speaker did not regard himself as deprived. It was the workers who were deprived, and consequently only the workers could act. The speaker called on workers to have a conviction which the speaker didn't have. He called on workers to translate words into actions, but his own action consisted only of words. And as they say of the Biancourt confrontation, there were clearly very few revolutionaries in the march or inside the factory. There were very few people who felt that whatever was inside that plant was theirs. There was apparently no one inside or outside the factory who regarded it as social property, 
one who knows its social property doesn't accept a bureaucrat blocking the door. People in that march had varied pretexts for doing nothing. Such action is premature, it's adventuristic. The plant isn't social property yet. Of course, of course, the CGT bureaucrats agreed with this reasoning, a reasoning which completely undermines any right the workers might have to strike. And 10,000 militants blandly accepted the authority of the union toughs who guarded the factory gates. In taking up Perlman and Gregoire's self-critique here, the point is not that Biancourt was the great if only moment when all could have been different if a different action or consciousness had prevailed. If the crowd outside Biancourt had acted in a different way, this would have had an impact. But what happened happened for specific reasons, contingent on the overall situation of the crowd, including their sense of themselves and what revolution involved. The ideology of the workers themselves, the notion that only the workers can do something, was one limit to the activity of many participants in 68. The idea that revolution is self-organization and that the self here is not whoever we are, but the workers themselves, was an objective feature of the situation. This conception of the revolution was not a mere idea that could contingently have been replaced with another, but a product of the whole cycle of struggles leading up to it. What Perlman and Gregoire's text indicates is that some of the more lucid participants were starting to question this conception. While the idea that workers and students must meet in dialogue was fairly prevalent, their text poses the issue differently. It suggests why not take the factory, not to restart production. It was a car factory after all, but to deny it to the enemy. And yes, at the risk of being called substitutionist to try to push the situation forward. The distinction between inside and outside, which in the normal course of events is a fundamental one, with interventions by revolutionaries or activists usually failing, must be called into question in situations of intense class and social struggle. Factories, the means of production, reproduction, and communication do not belong to their workers. Communist revolution requires an overcoming of the division of production by separate enterprises and of the separation between those who are inside and those who are outside of production. If this is now theoretically recognized as the problem that communism must overcome in situations of intense class struggle, this can begin to be posed as a practical problem. Was this really posed practically in 68? Clearly not. Would it be in the future, whether in Argentina in 2001, Greece in 2008, Cairo in 2011, or the yellow vests in France recently? One of the pronounced aspects of more recent struggles has been that they occur on a social terrain where the inside-outside issue is posed differently than it was in 68. The events of May 68, which saw almost no looting despite the withdrawal of the police, belonged to an earlier cycle of struggle. Though more min min minoritarian than May 68, the recent Yellow Vest movement shows how different the times are. What's at stake in this question is the very meaning of evolution of revolution and communism. If communist revolution is about workers self-managing production, then surely it is only workers who can do this. And in 68, workers showed very little interest in this. But if revolution and communism is the overcoming of separation, then the very notion of worker and not worker, my workplace and your workplace, is something to be challenged and overturned. As Perlman and Gregoire argue, those who display inactivity while waiting for the spontaneity of the workers appeared to reject the bureaucratic model of socialism, but accepted its ontological premises. Consequently, revolutionaries whose aim is to liberate daily life betray their project when they abdicate to passivity or impose themselves over it. The point is to wake the dead, to force the passive to choose between a conscious acceptance of constraint or a conscious affirmation of life. To force the passive to choose is, of course, often how a minority of workers inside an enterprise initiate any wildcat strike. What Perlman and Gregoire suggest is that in the right circumstances, that is what an active outside group can do as well. In most cases, such an attempt would be derisory and would fail, and likely it would have in 68, 
but this failure would be its critique, not the fact that something was done by one group in relation to another. An important figure in the post-68 debates was Gilles Dauvé. In Leninism and the ultra-left, Dauvé, while making some similar points to Perlman and Grégoire, goes further in trying to explicitly redeem the notion of the party. Dauvé argued that the Councilist position on organization was a critique of Leninism, which was tied negatively to its object, a reaction rather than an overcoming. In particular, he argues that Councilism, like anarchism, accepts the identification of party with the Leninist party. As a reaction to the historically counter-revolutionary role that the Bolsheviks came to take, the notion of a separate collectivity of revolutionaries or communists doing anything was seen as substitutionist and as threatening to dominate the class. What this misses for Dove is that there is a different conception of the party to be found in Marx based on the distinction of the historic and formal party. Marx had drawn this distinction in an 1860 letter to the poet Fre Freilagraf, who had been a member of the Communist League with Marx 10 years before. Marx had been attempting to enlist Freilagraf's support against slanderous claims being made by Karl Vogt about Marx and the Communist League. <clears throat> but Freilagraf declined to be involved, saying he was no longer a member of the party. Marx replied that he also no longer belongs to such a party because the party, in this wholly ephemeral sense, ceased to exist for me eight years ago, when it disbanded at his urging. Since 1852, then, I have known nothing of party, in the sense implied in your letter. Whereas you are a poet, I am a critic, and for me, the experiences of 1849 to 52 were quite enough. The League, like the Société des Saisons in Paris and a hundred other societies, was simply an episode in the history of a party that is everywhere springing up naturally out of the soil of modern society. I have tried to dispel the misunderstanding arising out of the impression that by party I meant a league that expired eight years ago, or an editorial board that was disbanded 12 years ago. By party I meant the party in the broad historical sense. It is likely that Dove had become aware of this distinction made by Marx through the text Origin and Function of the Party Form. In that work, Jacques Camat and Roger Dangeville trace the evolution of the party and how it has been understood by Marx and those influenced by him. Starting with the sect phase of the Communist League of the 1840s, Kemat and Dangeville follow the changing meaning of the party through the First International and the Paris Commune, and then show how these notions were first developed and then betrayed in the Second and Third Internationals, and finally how the Italian left stood in relation to this history. The text argues that the party is not fundamentally about forms of organization or bureaucratic rules, but is defined instead by its program, the prefiguration of communist society, of the liberated and conscious human species. The communist program, in turn, was not a product of Marx or any other individual, but something born of the struggle of the proletariat against capital in which it tries to form a community to replace the atomization of capitalist society and it is only given expression, often rather imperfectly, by individuals and groups. Marx and Engels had an intuition of the future society based on this struggle, and their work was an attempt to describe its emergence and to defend it against bourgeois society. Thus, the text argues that in its historic sense, the party is an impersonal force above generations. It represents the human species, the human existence which has finally been found it is the consciousness of the species. Organizations which claim to be the party, whether in the present or the past, are at best formal groups that temporarily express this historic force, but which just as often fail to do so, or represent it for some time or degree before passing over to the side of the counter-revolution. Dove argued that the historic formal distinction turns the opposition of need for the party versus fear of the party into a false dilemma. Shorn of its Leninist associations, the party no longer posed a problem. The party was not something created and built by a process of recruitment and indoctrination, as in the practice of the bureaucratic sects. 
but rather a spontaneous product of capitalist society that could only really be seen to emerge in revolutionary periods. Capitalism produced people who tried in one way or another to understand and combat the situation they found themselves in. Dove felt we can call some such people revolutionaries or communists and suggested that, contra the councilist fears, they should not be worried about seeking theoretical coherence and acting collectively to propagate their understandings. He contends that the revolutionary movement is an organic structure of which theory is an inseparable and indispensable element. Those trying to articulate such theory, those trying to express the whole meaning of what is going on and make practical proposals may in normal times have little effect. But in revolutionary periods, if the expression is right and the proposal appropriate, they are parts of the struggle of the proletariat and contribute to build the party of the communist revolution. The councilist opposition between willed and spontaneous organization is undermined by this kind of argument. If capitalist society gives rise spontaneously to forms of organized resistance, such as strikes and social movements, then the production of communists as a willed group is in its own way a spontaneous product. There are always minorities being produced who seek out others like themselves, both during struggles and in periods when less is going on. Thus, for Dove, the councilist valorization of the pole of spontaneity and their denigration of the willed alternative is unjustified. That the revolution in a fundamental sense comes from one pole does not mean that minorities at the other pole don't play a role. Individuals drawn to ideas of revolution and communism who then form willed groups or relate to each other in some less formal way are as much a natural product of capitalist society as the spontaneous struggles and movements that arise from time to time. Such groups will be imperfect because they too are part of bourgeois society. Many will, like most of the sects in 68, play a poor role. But if they do manage to express something communist, they are ephemeral expressions of a movement that emerges in and against capitalist society. Produced in revolutionary periods, such as the one which Dove thought he was living through, the party was not built by an act of will. It was just the organization of an emergent movement, as a member of the informal group Dove was part of puts it. When the proletariat is not revolutionary, it does not exist, and revolutionaries can produce nothing with it. It isn't they who, by playing the people's educators, can create the historic situation in which the proletariat becomes what it is but the very development of modern society. When such a situation appears, revolutionaries of non-working class origin, those who, for many reasons, find themselves confined within bourgeois society, unite themselves in the proletarian party, which spontaneously forms in order to solve the revolutionary tasks. However, if this 1969 critique of councilism, which draws on the historic formal party distinction, is indebted to origin and function, by that time, Kmet's own position had moved on. Kmet was impressed by and open to the character of the new revolt in a way the formal Bordigist group he had been part of was not. In the same year as Dove's intervention in ICO, Kmet, with Kolu, produced a letter later published as an organization, which is, if anything, more critical of the willed group than the councilists. Their letter denounces the attempts by political groups to recruit from the revolutionaries that were produced by the period and rejects the suggestion by some that the journal invariants in which they were both involved should constitute itself as such a group. An organization goes beyond the rejection of Leninism common to anarchists and councilists by identifying a tendency for any organization, whatever ideology it may espouse, whether it uses the term party or not, to become a gang or racket. This tendency is a result of the rival risk competitive existence that the capitalist mode of production imposes on individual and collective subjectivities. Consider the way political groups relate to each other as they compete for members and try to keep the ones they have. If in earlier capitalism it had been possible for working class organizations to represent some sort of community against capital in its period of real domination, Capital shapes both individual and collective subjectivities. In Kmet's view, even the group he had been part of, which by practicing anonymity and refusing democratic voting 
had opposed bourgeois individualism, or the sterile and pathological solitude of the ego, evolved into a gang, a collective form of that pathological ego in relation to the world. Linking back to the arguments of origin and function, Kmat and Kalu write, Today, the party can only be the historic party. Any formal movement is the reproduction of this society, and the proletariat is essentially outside of it. A group can in no way pretend to realize community without taking the place of the proletariat, which alone can do it. Such an attempt introduces a distortion that engenders theoretical ambiguity and practical hip hypocrisy. It is not enough to develop the critique of capital, nor even to affirm that there are no organizational links. It's necessary to avoid reproducing the gang structure since it is the spontaneous product of the society. So if the idea of the party as a spontaneous product ha had seemed to Dove to cut through the fear of the party of the German Dutch left, Kamat warned that the gang structure and its mentality is also spontaneously produced by capitalist society. In 1969, when On Organization was written, Kamat and Kalu argue for adopting the attitude um, for adopting the attitude they see Marx taking in his letter to Fre Freilagrath. One should refuse to constitute any kind of group and instead simply maintain a network of contacts with those who have appropriated or are in the process of appropriating theoretical knowledge. This appropriation would have to be an independent process without follower followerism and pedagogy because the party in its historical sense is not a school. Thus, rather than identifying with a group, the revolutionary can orientate to a theory, a work that is in process and needs to be developed. Such theory is not dependent on a group or journal, but is the expression of the class struggle. However, in a note written in 1972, Kamat identifies weaknesses in and possible misinterpretations of on organization. He noted that he and Kalu had been incorrect to take as a model a moment of Marx's activity from a very different period of capitalism. He observed that their focus on theory risked being seen as an elitist conception of the development of the revolutionary movement, bringing consciousness to the masses from outside. He suggested that the critique of organization could become an anti-organizational position, a unique selling property with which to seduce and attract in a new process of bracketization. It could be seen as a return to Stirner, with each individual cultivating his or her own revolutionary subjectivity. As Kamat writes, all political representation is a screen and therefore an obstacle to a fusion of forces. Since representation can occur on the individual as well as the group level, recourse to the former level would be for us a repetition of the past. So many false paths. Starting from an Italian left position on the party, seemingly the opposite of the councilists, we see Kamat ending in a similar place with a rejection of their pretensions of the small organized group. There is an underlying continuity in that Kamat's notion of the group becoming a gang or racket overlaps with the councilist view that the willed group will tend inevitably to be oriented to survival in capitalism. Both put their faith in the spontaneous organization that the class or species for the lad for the leader Kmat is led to. In spontaneous organization, there is much room for a learning dynamic in which the identity and self-understanding of those involved is transformed. In the willed group, there will be more of an investment in an identity around a set of ideas that leads to forms of behavior to defend that identity. The willed group, even if such group emerges spontaneously in response to a revolutionary wave, has a tendency to stick around longer than it has a purpose, becoming dominated by the gang mentality or of being pushed towards reformist or capitalist areas and forced to have a practice which is increasingly in contradiction with their avowed principles. To Kmat, this is a reason to avoid the group form entirely. A different way of responding to the tendencies he describes is to recognize that any willed collective undertaking, especially outside the excitement of a revolutionary moment, will have its identitarian gang dimension. The point is to be alert to it, name it when it shows itself, and try collectively to avoid or restrain it. 
Indeed, one might note that the longer such groups last, the more they risk falling into this um, structure, which suggests that groups should form for specific purposes and only continue as long as they think they are contributing to that purpose. And if that purpose is theory, then only so long as they feel they are contributing something useful. A purpose that we have found takes our interest, indeed, to which we have found ourselves driven, is communist theory, the thinking about capitalism and its overcoming. Our next section addresses how we think to do this. Two, open Marxism. Truth is not born, nor is it to be found inside the head of an individual person. It is born between people collectively searching for truth in the process of their dialogical interaction. That is a quote from Mikhail Bakhtin. If we are interested in thinking about capitalism and its overcoming Marx's work, and especially his description and critique of the capitalist mode of production, would seem an essential theoretical reference point, a foundation. Yet if we look at the record of Marxism in power from social democracy through the USSR, China, and other nations, we see that Marxism has by and large been a force for the development of capitalism rather than one for its overcoming. How might one separate Marx and Marxism from this history? Starting in the late 1980s in journals such as Common Sense and in a series of books, Richard Gunn, Werner Bonfeld, John Holloway, and others took up the term open Marxism. They adopted this expression from Johannes Agnoli, who, in a debate with Ernest Mendel, suggested the term for Marxism open to the heresy of reality. Gunn, Bonfeld, and others took this up in a similar sense, not to specify a particular school or kind of Marxism, but rather as a useful label to capture the living and revolutionary thread that various heterodox Marxisms, Cancel Communism, the Frankfurt School, the German New Marx Reading, Operismo, and Autonomous Marxism, had in common against the more dogmatic varieties. At a time of a perceived crisis of Marxism, in the face of a capitalist restructuring and bosses offensive, their move was an intervention in the name of Marxism's critical, revolutionary, and destructive purpose, not just against the then retreating forms of Marxist-Leninist orthodoxy, but also against the sociological and positivist forms of Marxism that had become dominant in academia. Instead of responding to the perceived crisis with a fundamentalist assertion of orthodoxy, they argued that the principle of doubt and the dissolution of false certainty was essential to an open Marxism. Despite Marxism's allegedly final exhaustion, Marxism is not in crisis as long as it provokes and produces crises of historically developed schools or of Marxists themselves. Metaphorically, Marxism is the theoretical concept of practice and the practical concept of theory which provokes crises of itself as a matter of its inherent strength and validity. Of course, it might be asked whether one needs to defend something like Marxism at all. One might, as the SI did, reject all isms as ideologically fixed forms of thought. One might reserve the term Marxism for the ideology based on Marx's ideas which is to be distinguished from the revolutionary or communist use. Yet even if one was to take this route, there would remain the question of how to distinguish, other than by fiat, one's own authentic communist use of Marx from an ideological Marxist one. The impulse behind identifying an open Marxism, or like the SI, being not a Marxist in the same way as Marx, are the same. The point is not whether one adopts or resists the label um, Marxist, but how to develop thinking that is adequate to the raw material of reality. How do we avoid filtering existence to fit our preconceived ideas, simply asserting our limited perspective as the truth? More specifically, how can one grasp one's experience through Marxist categories without dogmatically reading reality through their prism? Do we have or need a philosophy or a method? Do we have principles of some sort that we apply? How do we deal with arguments from people who do not share the categories that we use? How do we conceive of the unity of theory and practice 
If the point is to change it, does this mean we pick up and discard theory based on how useful it is in struggles? Can theory be seen as a kind of weapon used in the fight, or as Moss suggested, is its first purpose to seek the truth of the situation? One idea from open Marxism that has consistently informed how we see ourselves and what we are doing is the notion articulated by Richard Gunn of the good conversation. This notion is key to our self-understanding of how thinking occurs and how theory is developed. The idea of the conversation grasps in a very concrete way the so sociality of human thinking. As Bakhtin and Vola Volishinov have persuasively made clear, even that thinking which we do inside our heads is part of conversational chain. We are always taking up thoughts started by others agreeing or disagreeing, responding to critics and interlocutors, and anticipating what may be said in response. Thought is social through and through. However, such so sociality applies as much to ideology as to theory, as much to the way we reproduce ideas that conform to the existing social order, as to developing a thinking which points beyond it. If we are interested in the latter, we need a more nuanced conception of the conversation. Just as not all of what people consider as thinking is really thinking, not all conversation on our own or with others is good conversation. We are also aware of the way that appeals to dialogue and conversation and to free speech are commonplace calls that can perform very ideological functions, including that of diverting us from necessary action. Even within milieus that see themselves as antagonistic to this society, there are forms of bad conversations such as preaching to the converted, dialogues of the deaf, endless discussions with no consequences. It is thus necessary to specify what we mean by good conversation. What kind of conversation is to be aimed at? For Gunn, as we shall see, good conversation is defined by mutual recognition, practical reflexivity, and imminent critique. In more recent texts, Gunn and Adrian Wilding argue that notions of mutual recognition and the conversation are nothing less than a key to revolutionary action and to communism itself. The idea that the small-willed group aiming to understand capitalism and its overcoming and the spontaneous revolutionary crowd and mass action that will actually produce that overcoming have an underlying coherence through the notion of mutual recognition is an idea that is fascinating for us, and we will try to unpack it in detail. Marxism and philosophy. The initial reason for Gunn's essay, Marxism and philosophy, was to respond to Roy Baskar's offer of critical realism as a philosophy for Marxism and the left. In his response, Gunn notes that before one decides whether or not Marxism needs a critical realist philosophy, one needs to ask whether it needs a philosophy at all. We are not interested in Gunn's text for what it says about Baskar, but in its attempt to sketch, in contrast to critical realism, an alternative understanding of the conceptual status of Marxist thought. Gunn argues that in offering a philosophy for the left, Baskar accepted the bourgeois separation of second-order meta-theory, theory about categories, from first-order theory about the world. Gunn argues that this separation is a product of bourgeois enlightenment, which reached its apogee in the 20th century, when philosophy reduced itself to the handmaiden of science. He argues that Marx and Hegel before him rejected this separation. This is not, however, because Marxism is a positivist or scientistic discourse, uninterested in categorical questions, nor because it returns to the old cosmological unity that prevailed before the rise of capitalism, but rather because it is integrated what are seen, what are seen as philosophical questions in a unitary form of self-reflexive theorizing about the world. Gunn argues that Marxism doesn't need a philosophy or meta-theory to pack up his, its theory of the social world, because Marxian discourse, such as Capital, like Hegel's phenomenology before it, moves between first-order theory about the world and second-order theory about the categories with which it grasps the world, in a single movement of totalization. If such totalization is at once practically reflexive, imminently critical, and based on mutual recognition, then it constitutes good conversation. Though Gunn writes at a fairly high level of sophistication and abstraction, 
the thrust of his argument is to locate a capacity to address issues of categorical validity, a capacity, in other words, for critical theory, within the first order experience and self-awareness of, so to say, every man, every man rather than in the privileged meta-awareness of a philosophical elite. Gunn argues that theory or truth is produced in a good, not necessarily polite conversation, in which all participants put their views of the world, the categories with which they grasp the world, and indeed all aspects of themselves at stake. Such conversation is based on or moves in the direction of mutual recognition. Gunn suggests that outside of conditions of social revolution and struggle, mutual recognition only exists in a contradictory form. And thus, moments of such conversation are relatively rare, and perhaps only to be approximated imperfectly. It is sometimes said that a defining aspect of the kind of conversation we want is a particular orientation to practice. In his famous Theses on Feuerbach, Marx suggested an orientation to changing the world. But it is important that this not be understood in the rather facile and normative, oops, and normative way in which theory and practice are imagined as separate realms that need to be brought together in an activist way. The bringing together of theory and practice suggests an external relation between the two. Rather, as Gunn suggests, we can conceive of the unity of theory and practice in terms of practical reflexivity. Gunn argues that the relation of theory and practice is internal, not external. They mutually constitute each other. Practical reflexivity is a theorizing that recognizes itself and its categories as part of the contradictory social practice that it tries to make sense of. The categories it uses are not guaranteed by separate philosophy or methodology. Rather, in a process of imminent critique, theorizing that is practically reflexive takes up and critically interrogates the meaning of the categories found in its social world. Such categories are part of the way capitalist society spontaneously presents itself to all its participants. They occur in everyday common sense as much as in systematic theor theorizations by philosophers and ideologists. An example that Gunn takes up from Marx is the moment in Capital where Marx determines that the key prerequisite for Capital, MCM, is the buying and selling of labor power and what this involves. When Marx says that the sphere of exchange within which labor power is bought and sold is a realm of freedom, equality, property, and Bentham. He points to the fact that everyday social practice includes theoretical categories as part of its reproduction, that the very notion we have of the individual, the kind of subjects we are, how we understand ourselves, how we think and act, is constituted by such social practice. For example, the categories of individuality and rational self-interest that Bentham reflects in his utilitarianism appear self-evident and self-explanatory to agents in bourgeois society. However, such obviousness is socially and historically constituted through a process of alienation, atomization, and separation. Practically reflexive theorizing refuses the obviousness of those categories by asking how such obviousness is socially constructed. Practical reflexivity, recognition of the social constitution of oneself and one's categories is required if one is to grasp the mystification or sorry, mystificatory, partial and thus false nature of these appearances, ideologies, that is to say the way they are a necessary functional mediation of other processes, exploitation, alienation, domination, which they at the same time systematically conceal. Thus the critique of capitalist social relations involves at the same time a critique of ourselves and the categories with which we understand ourselves and vice versa. To question ourselves and our categories is tantamount to the critique of capitalist social relations. Another example of the si simultaneity of first and second order theorizing is Marx's statement in Capital that individuals are treated only in terms of their character masks as the personifications of economic categories, embodiments of particular class relations and class interests. This is generally taken as a methodological second order point but as Gunn and Wilding suggest, this point is at the same moment a very first-order critique of the reductivism, 
experiential impoverishment, discomfort, and oversimplification, oversimplification of the life world, which he is describing. What makes a good conversation? To critically examine one's own experience and categories, one must be open to the other experiences and theories found in one's social world. This means not simply criticizing other experiences and theories from one's own position, but being open to their criticism, since a critique that is merely external in third person would omit the moment of, in the course of, self-risk. Thus, Gunn suggests that practical reflexivity and imminent critique are essentially a conversation. A practically reflexive, imminent critique of capitalist society and the everyday ideas and theories which justify it is not a critique from a superior worldview or from an already assumed political position of opposition. It is rather an open encounter with other viewpoints and experiences. This suggests an answer to the crucial question of how it is possible for a conversation between those who don't share the same categories to nonetheless come to compelling conclusions. Because we share the same social and practical world in a way we did not before the dominance of the capitalist mode of production, the fundamental question we pose one another within conversation is, it's like this, isn't it? Each statement of how things are always invites response from others along the lines of, no, it's like this, or yes, but also. In a dynamic relation with others, we constantly describe and re-describe the world. The, phenomenon <laughs> the phenomenological aspect of this, the appeal to experience, means for Gunn that no prior agreement on method or categories is necessary for the conversation. The object itself can play a partial role in determining how validly it, validly it may be categorically known. In such a conversation, every aspect of each participant's view must be able to be brought into play. Theoretical and metatheoretical dimensions, as well as considerations of where practically each participant is coming from. But this does not mean one can simply dismiss monologically the other as, say, a bourgeois apologist, an academic, a militant, or of the wrong identity category. One must draw out the limitations of the other's argument with regards to his own contradictions and inadequacy to the world which it claims to explain. It is only reasonable to question the other's viewpoint along the lines of, you would think that because you, if one is open to both hear how the other responds to this claim and to have similar questions directed toward oneself. The idea of a rigorous open conversation in which each participant challenges the other on the basis that they too are open to such challenge can be a regulative idea. Gunn merely makes explicit something that people already try to do through discussions, reading, meetings, critiques, uh, publications and offers a prophylactic against the way notions of philosophy or method can detract from such openness. Conversation, of course, happens all the time, and this cannot in itself play the role Gunn suggests. Crucial here is the difference between good conversation and disappointing conversation. Gunn does not valorize conversation per se, but good conversation, which he says is relatively rare, the difference between good and disappointing conversation is an experience we all have and to which we can refer to make sense of what Gunn is getting at. If this focus on talk or ideas seems too idealist, let us note that a reference to experience and practice constantly feeds into this conversation. And if it sounds too polite or democratic, Gunn notes, nothing is less polite than rigorous conversation pursued to its end. No one can say in advance where, into what issues of life and death struggle, good conversation may lead. As Gunn's comments about the tedium of philosophy and the positivism of the sciences indicate, in the area of bourgeois society apparently reserved for free and disinterested, truth-oriented conversation, the specialties of academia work against the to totalization that good conversation needs. His fundamental point, though, is that inside or outside of academia, good conversation cannot occur 
where the theory meta theory distinction is respected, whether as academic specialty or as an unreflected limitation on thinking, nor where people relate through social roles, including those of lecturer and student, leader and led, represented and representative, or as property owners. These considerations lead him to the position that the true site of good conversation in capitalism is the revolutionary crowd. So far, we have addressed Gunn's ideas in terms of their relevance for the kind of interactions between and within individuals and small groups oriented to theory production. That is to say, in Henry Simon's terms, more on the willed pole than the spontaneous pole. It is notable, though, that Gunn, along with Adrian Wilding in a recent series of texts, has returned to such ideas in the context of the large-scale social movements and struggles since the 2008 crisis. In these more recent texts, they argue that the idea of mutual recognition and the conversation is central, not just a small-scale interaction with texts and other people in the social production of truth and theory, but also that it is at the heart of recent struggles of the revolutionary process in general and of communism itself. The unbearable openness of communism. Gunn and Wilding argue that the mutual recognition as it was identified and described by Hegel in the phenomenology is at the core of Marx's critique of capitalism and conception of communism. The heart of mutual recognition is that individuals enjoy freedom through interaction with one another Mutual recognition involves the recognition of the other's freedom. Recognition only counts as recognition when it is freely given, and freedom is only freedom when it is recognized. Their argument is that capitalism undermines mutual recognition. It does so not in the way that the relations of direct domination of pre-capitalism did, but through the structuring of social interaction by social institutions and definitional, definitional roles, such as those of private property, politics, educational institutions, the mass media, etc., a kind of structuring that stands over individuals. It might be objected that capitalism is precisely defined by the mutual recognition of commodity owners, where each recognizes the other as the owner of either commodity or money, and obtains what the other has only by a freely entered exchange. This aspect of capitalism is affirmed by Hegel as abstract right. It was an essential contribution of Marx to grasp how, when one moves from the sphere of exchange to that of production, this system of equality and freedom turns out to be a system of inequality and unfreedom. The formal recognition of freedom and equality continually reproduces relations of capital and labor, that is, of inequality, exploitation, and domination. This is accepted by Gunn and Wilding, but their argument is that what this means is that in capitalism we are dealing with a contradictory form of mutual recognition, contradicted by the existence of these role definitions and in social institutions, most pronouncedly the social institution of property. The relation between wage workers and their bosses is a free contract where each is recognized, but behind this is the fact that employers represent a world of absolute property and workers a world of propertylessness, a relation that is constantly reproduced. As such, reciprocity falls short of unconstrained interaction and freedom, is limited to what the role definitions concerned um, permit. Property in its various forms, commodities, markets, and the power of money stands over and against the individuals who, in order to survive, must relate to each other as proprietors. As Gunn and Wilding argue, when property, not just this or that species of property, but property per se is dispensed with, individuality ceases to be monological and possessive. Freedom ceases to exist in spite of other individuals. Once property is transcended, freedom exists in and through interaction with others and individuals risk their identity and mutual recognitions flow. For Gunn and Wilding, Marx's view of proletarian revolution is nothing less than a break from one-sided and or role definitional recognition into uncontradicted, uncontradicted mutual recognition, which respects no pre-given structures, but on the basis of an unrestricted and thus free interaction, 
following only those goals which it has set for itself. Here we can see the radical difference between the revolutionary recognition appealed to by Gunn and Wilding and that evoked by left liberal theorists of recognition such as Taylor and Honneth. Those figures draw on the reconciled Hegel of the philosophy of right and thus accept the separate spheres and institutions of capitalist society, which means a recognition of social roles and relating through role definitions. Gunn and Wilding draw on the phenomenology, which is inspired by the wild recognition of the French Revolution where social institutions, what Hegel calls spiritual masses, are dissolved. Only in such a revolutionary situation is an uncontradicted mutual recognition possible. Um, one where there is an I, that is we, and we, that is I, and in which each undivided by the whole always, oops, always does everything. And what appears to be done by the whole is the direct and conscious deed of each. For the late Hegel of the philosophy of right, this possibility is confined to the religious community. This expresses the shift of the historical moment from the immediate post-revolutionary one of the phenomenology to the conservative post-restoration climate of the 1820s. Gunn and Wilding's argument is that the kind of thinking suggested by Hegel in the phenomenology, while now appearing esoteric and requiring deep effort to grasp, would have been in everyone's grasp in the revolutionary situation, the sunlight of the French Revolution that produced it. At that time, this science would have met a mutually recogn um, recognitive, recognitive, recognitive audience ripe to receive truth. That is one that, that could have learned and appropriated in a questioning and evaluative, evaluative rather than a merely passive and accepting way. Thus, the principle of conversation that communist theory invokes is very different from that which is sometimes called up in capitalist politics and civil society. We can say that where uncontradicted, i.e. revolutionary, interaction is denied, good conversation is rare and under pressure at all times. Much of the difficulty and complexity of communist theory is related to this situation. Communist conversation in a revolution or situation of intense struggle erupts everywhere. At other times, it is not easy. There is an objection that Gunn and Wilding are aware of, that their suggestion of the centrality of conversation and mutual recognition to the revolutionary process makes such a process sound too genteel. Here are the links they make between such conversation and the revolutionary crowd and its form of violence are important. In a situation of role definitions and separation of spheres, Violence can be a necessary part of establishing the conversation, a form of, co of communication, part of establishing the conversation, oh, sorry, a form of communication that tends toward mutual recognition. The pre-established channels, social roles, and institutions that distort or contradict mutual recognition are cleared away in the revolutionary situation which allows an unconstrained interaction, interaction which is open to all comers and where any issue, whatever may be raised. A revolutionary process with society polarizing into a party of anarchy and party of order advances by drawing more and more people into the conversation. Mutual recognition is arrived at in and through conflict with these, with those who would deny it. And indeed, when confronted with the active enemies of mutual recognition, for example, the police. Violence and force is the way the party of order enters into the conversation. In the example of the French Revolution, it was the perceived threat of the army that created the fused group which stormed the Bastille. Writing in the aftermath of the 1990 poll tax riots, Gunn turns around the normal distinction between violence and force. It is not the instrumental violence of the state that is acceptable, but the communicative violence of the crowd. Gunn argues that a consistent and genuine pacifist position may have to celebrate the participatory or communicative violence, which liberals count horrendous, and deplore the instrumental and statist violence which liberals reluctantly defend. In a strikingly spiky passage, Gunn suggests 
that the violence of revolution involves a rise and fall of factions so swift that none can claim legitimacy and so contingent that we can never declare an allegiance to one or other of them opens a space for a political conversation of the best sort. Over our last glass of wine at the end of the evening, our conversation is likely to be sharpened if neither of us knows which of us may be unlocking the guillotine blade tomorrow. Humanism? <laughs> Question mark. The unashamed embrace of Hegel in this kind of argumentation may be uncomfortable to those steeled in the anti-humanism of recent French thought. Gunn and Wilding address this issue directly. Noting that humanism can mean several things, only some of which are objectionable. They argue that Marx and Hegel rejected humanism based on a scenario of history involving a pre-existing human essence waiting to be realized. Thus they state, if the notion of humanism turns on the idea of self-realization, Marx, Marx is, we may agree with Althusser, a theoretical anti-humanist. But so they would contend was Hegel. Their claim is that neither Marx nor the Hegel of the phenomenology has a teleological view of history in which humanity is seen as a grand totalizer or global subject, and history as that subject's expression of self-realization. They acknowledge that they have placed the idea of uncontradicted recognition in a similar conceptual place to the idea of such a subject. However, they point out that uncontradicted recognition is not a fixed and determinate entity, self or subject, that can realize itself. It is rather an endless process, because while such recognition is a situation where freedom, understood as self-determination, and an unfolding of human capacities obtains, it is at the same time the polar opposite of fixity and determination. Thus, Gunn and Wilding assert the ghost of humanism is laid. However, Gunn and Wilding recognize that laying to rest the ghost of humanism and ending the mystification it entails involves a cost. Compared to the comforting humanist vision of self-realization of the historic subject, Gunn and Wilding emphasize that revolution conceived as mutual recognition has dark or less than comforting aspects. The world of social institutions that Hegel called spiritual masses implies something quasi-natural that stands over individuals. Revolutionary recognition overthrows these institutions. At the same moment, this quasi-natural aspect of social institutions pro uh, provides, for most people, most of the time, a certain reliability and security. Human society reproduces itself behind people's backs. It appears to follow natural laws. This is, at the same time, alienating and reassuring. One knows where one is with money. It can reliably command the labor of others, and relatedly, one can rely on people acting out of role definitions because their private attitude is essentially irrelevant. By contrast, relations of mutual recognition make more demands upon us. They are based at all times on personal relations, and one has to assess if the speech or action is made in good faith. Mutual recognition involves a, re a relinquishment of the beguiling and bewitching security afforded by institutions and social roles. A condition based on mutual recognition is, as Gunn and Wilding put it, more artificial and less natural, or strictly speaking, less quasi-natural than a condition of alienation. Freedom is exposed, or as Gunn and Wilding say, excor excoriated. They write, communism knows no natural or quasi-natural inertia, although it is humane. There is no question of man's or humanity's realizing its true essence or true nature. Lacking quasi-natural security, communism lacks the stability and inertia or that inertia brings. At each stage in a communist society's existence, a relapse into what Hegel terms history and what Marx terms hitherto existing society remains a possibility. No guarantees against a relapse are conceivable. More than this, what may be termed ontological insecurity and communism are inseparable. In the margins of a text describing communist existence, hints of existential horror appear. The idea that communism involves the achievement of good conversation is similar to the ways some groups, like uh, Thierry Communist and the Invisible Committee,
have taken up the tradition, the traditional African idea of the palabra. Speculating about communism, Bernard Lyon states, The central element of praxis is the palabra, which is at the same time antecedent, concomitant, and subsequent to all action. The palabra is the mode of decision, of control and rectification of all acts. It has no end. It includes all activities, and for all activities, we take the time to go right to the provisional end of the palabra. The palabra is knowledge of the real conscious action. Conscious history means that we come to an agreement. The quest for the best possible decision, for the maximum possible points of view, for an action that can be, char uh, can be changed or even cancelled, not weighing down the future, is the constant concern of the palabra in and between the networks. Conflicts are never conflicts of interest, because there is no situation to reproduce in which the conflicts are insoluble. Communism will be the achievement and maintenance of good conversation through the overthrow of existing social institutions. In the absence of such an overthrow, the achievement of mutual recognition and good conversation can only be approximated and is always at risk. It is possible for two people or a small group to maintain a good conversation, but it is difficult. The maintenance of good conversation in a group oriented to communist revolution is thus a challenging endeavor, which can only be approximated. The cases with which we started this text provide examples of the kind of tensions that may interfere or destroy mutual recognition in a group and cause the conversation to fail. How can we make sense of such occurrences?